Hey, so almost every one of us South Asians has heard of Ashoka Maurya, the Gangetic ruler from the 3rd century BCE. The amount of fascination and adulation that Ashoka has provoked is comparable only to much more recent historical figures. Across the political spectrum, historians and political leaders have competed to claim that he was one of their own, an enlightened ruler. He's held up as proof that India was united in some primordial past and that dharma, conveniently interpreted, can and should be the guiding ideology of the 21st century nation-state. But many of these ideas are castles in the air. Recent archaeological studies of the Mauryas question everything we confidently believe about them, revealing a much more fascinating ancient world. I'm Anirudh Kaneseti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. To Indian nationalists and freedom fighters in the 20th century, especially Jawaharlal Nehru, Ashoka was an emblem of past unity at a time when their political landscape was fractured by hundreds of princely states. Ashoka's dharma was seen as similar to emerging concepts of secularism, which were desperately needed by a nation reeling from partition and the conflation of religious and political identities. Ashoka's association with the spread of Buddhism also seemed to be proof that India, loosely and conveniently defined, had always been the center from which ideas flowed to the rest of Asia. This dovetailed with the need for national pride as well as Nehru's attempt to create a post-colonial bloc of nations. So it's really no wonder that much of independent India's architecture and iconography were inspired by the Mauryas. But many of these assumptions are based on shaky evidence. Strictly speaking, dharma can't be interpreted as secular when Ashoka is frequently at pains to present himself as a Buddhist layman at a time when Buddhism was an aggressively proselytizing new faith. Furthermore, the heyday of Buddhist transmission outside the subcontinent began well after Ashoka's death and was driven by local market demand rather than vague notions of India's superiority. More in next week's video. Finally, simply setting up edicts had little to do with actual political control as established by the rapid decline of Mauryan power after Ashoka's death. So clearly, something's missing in how we think of the Mauryas. In Questions of Intended Meaning and the Ashokan Edicts, archaeologist Namita Sugandhi argues that colonial historians translated Ashoka's words in excessively grandiose ways. This led to fanciful interpretations of the structure of the Maurya polity. For example, she notes, scattered references to royal princes have been used to claim that the empire was divided into north, south, east, and west provinces, even though the edicts actually say nothing of the sort. Similarly, merely the presence of a Mayan inscription is taken as proof of control or influence, by which logic we might as well conclude that 14th century Tamil merchants who built a temple in Guangzhou ruled all of China. More in this video here. Once we strip away the assumptions, the Mauryas emerge as much more interesting and challenging individuals. They were the culmination of a nearly 300-year-long process of political consolidation within the Gangetic Plains, which had been characterized by ruthless violence, both within and between polities. Throughout this time, religious and commercial networks also grew more extensive, and South Asia became closely connected to West Asia. The arrival of a marauding Greek army in Punjab in 326 BCE and the establishment of Hellenic cities in Afghanistan are examples of this. Developments were also afoot in the Deccan by 300 BCE, where the Iron Age was well in progress. In a 2021 interview with me, Professor Sugandhi pointed out that the people of the Deccan were using advanced metallurgical techniques, trading and warring between small settlements, and even indulging in international trade, all without having cities, states, or extensive agriculture. And it is in this world that the Maurya dynasty ruled, conquered, and died. It is impossible to reconstruct precisely how they rose to power. That's a problem that historian Devika Rangachari addresses in her recent book, The Mauryas, using later legends and literary works. All that we can say with certainty is that the Mauryas did seize control of the Gangetic Plains and undertook wide-ranging expeditions to maintain their superiority. They were aware of their growing geopolitical horizons and exchanged embassies with the Mediterranean world. But 
claims of Mauryan conquest or control of the subcontinent at large, making them the first Indian empire as a lot of historians claim, are exaggerated and based on insufficient evidence. I get why we want to see the present reflected in the past and why we need to imagine that India's history is some kind of grand story to make us feel good about today's nation. But doing that doesn't allow us to see our history as it truly was, which is as a confusing, messy but supremely interesting place. But to see that, we need to allow it to speak to us on its own terms, instead of trying to fit it into our limited modern political imaginations. So let's think about the Mauryas in more grounded and realistic terms. No modern or pre-modern polity survived without logistics, profit and productivity, and it's very unlikely that the Deccan in 300 BCE could have offered all that to the Maurya polity. Nearly the size of France, the Deccan approaches the Gangetic plains in scale and outstrips it in sheer geographical diversity. It was by no means profitable for Gangetic empires to invest in military and administrative infrastructure to control what was then a vast and sparsely populated region. In interpreting the Mauryan Empire, historian Himanshu Prabhare made the case that there's actually no archaeological evidence of such infrastructure at all. In fact, Mauryan inscriptions in the Deccan mostly seem to be copies of one of Ashoka's minor rock edicts and are located near smaller religious sites rather than major population centers. This suggests that the primary audience of these edicts were not subjects of the Mauryas, but people whom they wished to impress and perform in front of. But who could have commissioned the edicts and why? In Between the Patterns of History, Professor Sugandhi examined archaeological evidence from Tekalakota, a Neolithic and Iron Age site in the southern Deccan. There's an Ashokan edict there, and a few North Indian silver coins were found during excavations. But overwhelmingly, Tekalakota's material culture was almost identical to its neighborhood, with barely any influence from the distant Gangetic Empire aside from, perhaps, trade. So agents of the Mauryas in this region were probably just local elites who were seeking to link themselves to new subcontinental networks rather than officers appointed by Ashoka Maurya. Or they may have been merchants or Buddhist monks from the Gangetic Plains who were penetrating new markets with the support of a state that was aggressively looking outwards. Rather than seeing Ashoka and the Mauryas as the protagonists of history, we now have a more compelling model of early Indian history as resulting from the activities of many networks, many power centers, and many people. It was through such activities that Buddhism, the subcontinent's first great cultural export, spread into the rest of the world, and it makes intuitive sense that this is how it spread to the subcontinent too. After all, we're humans as well. South Asia is governed by the same fundamental historical forces as any other part of the globe. What makes the Maurya so important is not that they were Jawaharlal Nehru or Sardar Vallabhai Patel in the 3rd century BCE, or even that they had dramatic lives that continued to echo through religious texts for centuries. Rather, they're important because they're among the few named individuals that we know of from a most remarkable period, one where the Gangetic Plains became a great outward-looking center of global culture and commerce for the first time. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at anirbuddha and at connectedhistories and on Twitter at akanisati. We'll see you next week.